and welcome to the Alliance Resource Partners LP First Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing star then zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on a touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would like now to turn the conference over to Brian Cantrell, Senior VP and Chief Financial Officer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Matt, and welcome, everyone. Earlier this morning, Alliance Resource Partners released its first quarter 2021 financial and operating results, and we will now discuss these results as well as our perspective on market conditions and outlook. Following our prepared remarks, we'll open the call to your questions. Before beginning, a reminder that some of our remarks today may include forward-looking statements subject to a variety of risks, uncertainties, and assumptions that are contained in our filings from time to time with the Securities and Exchange Commission and are also reflected in this morning's press release. While these forward-looking statements are based on the information currently available to us, if one or more of these risks or uncertainties materialize, or if our underlying assumptions prove incorrect, Actual results may vary materially from those we projected or expected. In providing these remarks, the partnership has no obligation to publicly update or revise any forward-looking statement, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise, unless required by law to do so. Finally, we'll also be discussing certain non-GAAP financial measures, definitions and reconciliations of the differences between these non-GAAP financial measures and the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are contained at the end of ARLP's press release, which has been posted on our website and furnished to the SEC on Form 8K. With the required preliminaries out of the way, I'll turn the call over to Joe Kraft, our Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer for his opening comments. Joe? Thank you, Brian, and good morning, everyone. We entered 2021 with the expectation that Alliance was poised to benefit from improved U.S. and global economic activity and increased energy demand as vaccines became more available. The solid financial performance we posted earlier this morning and that Brian will review in more detail in a moment suggest our expectations were well-founded. Coming into the year, we focused on advancing key initiatives across the Alliance organization. Among those initiatives were efforts we mentioned during our last earnings call to maximize the value of our existing assets and to explore new value-creating opportunities. We took the first step to unlock and highlight value embedded in our existing assets with the addition of a new coal royalty segment to separately report royalty income from coal reserves owned by ARLP's land company <clears throat> and leased to certain of our mining subsidiaries, primarily in the Illinois Basin. We believe combining coal royalties with oil and gas royalties to form a larger enhanced total royalties group provides several benefits. Aggregating the results of all our royalty activities allows us to better inform ARLP's unit holders and analysts of the cash flow potential of this part of our business to generate long-term royalty income free of CapEx requirements with minimal working capital requirements and limited operating costs. With visibility to the mine plans of our coal operating subsidiaries, we expect results from our coal royalty segment will be rather predictable, adding greater certainty and stability to the results of our total royalty activity. We also expect to realize future cost efficiencies by combining the management of our various royalty activities. In addition, we believe aggregating the cash flow from these two royalty sources will improve our ability to secure lower cost financing to support future growth of these segments. As we look at other royalty companies, uh, recent total enterprise value multiples have been in a range of 7 to 11 times EBITDA, well above ARLP's current 3.3 times multiple. By emphasizing the full magnitude of ARLP's royalty activities, and as we continue to expand in this area, we are hopeful that the market will begin to fully recognize the true value of this part of our business. As we have managed through the uncertainties and disruptions created by the pandemic over the last year, 
ARLP has been clearly focused on protecting our balance sheet, and we continued to make progress on this initiative during the 2021 quarter. Utilizing free cash flow generated during the quarter and cash on hand, ARLP reduced its total debt and finance lease obligations by $52.9 million and lowered total leverage to 1.43 times, a 6.5% improvement from the sequential quarter. We have also been very clear that once the situation began to stabilize, returning cash to our unit holders was among our highest priorities. On the strength of our recent performance and with our outlook continuing to improve, management believes we have reached that point, and I'm very pleased that the board supported our view by declaring a 10 cent per unit cash distribution to unit holders for the 2021 quarter. And setting an annualized distribution level at approximately 30% of this year's anticipated free cash flow before investments and growth opportunities, this distribution provides ARLP with the flexibility to pursue projects capable of providing long-term value for our unit holders while maintaining a conservative balance sheet. With our estimated distributable cash flow coverage ratio comfortably above four times for the year, we also believe this distribution is sustainable for the foreseeable future. I'll now turn the call back to Brian for a more detailed look at our results. Brian? Thank you, Joe. This morning, ARLP reported net income for the 2021 quarter of $24.7 million, or $0.19 cents per basic and diluted limited partner unit an increase of $169.5 million compared to a net loss of $144.8 million for the 2020 quarter, and excluding the impact of $157 million of non-cash charges in the 2020 quarter, we more than doubled the adjusted net income of $12.2 million in that prior quarter. Lower coal shipments contributed to a 9.2% decline in total revenues compared to the 2020 quarter, Lower revenues, however, were largely offset by a $37.8 million reduction in operating expenses as efficiency initiatives at our coal operations continued to drive down costs. As a result, segment-adjusted EBITDA in the 2021 quarter decreased only slightly to $109.8 million compared to $111.7 million in the 2020 quarter. While these results were generally in line with our expectations, ARLP's performance for the 2021 quarter would have been even better, but for weather-related transportation disruptions and an unplanned customer plant outage causing approximately 950,000 tons of delayed coal shipments and negatively impacting our cash flow and EBITDA by approximately $13 million. We currently expect these delayed coal shipments will be delivered to customers over the balance of the year. Taking a closer look at the performance of ARLP's coal operations, the previously mentioned shipment delays, as well as lower price realizations due to the expiration of higher price legacy contracts, led coal sales revenue in the 2021 quarter lower compared to both the 2020 and sequential quarters. Unplanned shipment delays also impacted total coal inventories, which increased by 1.2 million tons during the 2021 quarter. Ongoing expense control initiatives at all ARLP operations drove costs per ton lower compared to the 2020 quarter, with total segment-adjusted EBITDA expense declining 10.5% to $29.72 per ton for the 2021 quarter. Compared to the sequential quarter, total segment-adjusted EBITDA expense per ton increased 5.2%, primarily due to increased subsidence expense and severance taxes at our Tunnel Ridge mine and higher costs associated with increased metallurgical coal sales at our Matiki mine. ARLP's royalties segments posted solid results for the 2021 quarter. Our oil and gas royalty segment benefited from significantly higher commodity prices compared to both the 2020 and sequential quarters, pushing ARLP's average price realizations per BOE higher by 21.6% and 30.5% respectively. Although sales volumes continue to reflect the impacts of dramatically reduced drilling and completion activity during much of last year, increased operator activity on our acreage led production for the 2021 quarter to exceed our expectations. 
Strong commodity pricing and greater than anticipated production drove segment adjusted EBITDA for oil and gas royalties to $11.9 million, an increase of 16.7% compared to the sequential quarter. For our coal royalty segment, increased revenue per royalty ton sold more than offset lower volumes, leading segment adjusted EBITDA higher to $7.3 million an increase of 5.3% and 3.7% compared to the 2020 and sequential quarters, respectively. On a combined basis, our oil and gas royalties and coal royalties contributed $19.2 million of segment-adjusted EBITDA in the 2021 quarter, or approximately 17.5% of ARLP's consolidated total. I'll close my comments with an update on guidance. On the strength of ARLP's performance to start the year, and an improved outlook for the balance of the year, we are increasing full year guidance for uh, 2021. With strong coal burn during the polar vortex in February, lower utility stockpiles, and a favorable natural gas price curve, we expect increased coal buying activity in our domestic markets over the rest of 2021. Improving international coal market fundamentals should also create additional export sales opportunities this year. As a result, ARLP is increasing the midpoint of its 2021 coal sales volumes to 31 million tons. I mentioned earlier that production volumes for oil and gas royalties exceeded our expectations during the 2021 quarter. The current pace of drilling, completion, and permitting activity on our acreage suggests this trend will continue for the remainder of 2021, and we are now anticipating full-year production near the top end of our initial ranges. With increased production and continued strength in commodity pricing, we now anticipate the 2021 EBITDA contribution from our oil and gas royalty segment will be 20% to 25% above 2020 levels. I will also note that we have increased the range for total segment adjusted EBITDA expense for our coal operations by approximately a dollar per ton. This increase reflects the cost of intercompany coal royalties at our coal operating segments that are now reported separately in our coal royalty segment. With that, I'll turn the call back to Joe for some final comments. Joe? Thank you, Brian. As we look to the future, ARLP is committed to creating long-term value for our unit holders. And I want to clearly state how we intend to achieve that goal. First, ARLP remains committed to thermal coal. While headlines and rhetoric may suggest otherwise, recent challenges and disruptions experienced in Texas in California emphasized the importance of coal to maintaining an efficient, reliable, and resilient power grid. The common sense reality is that until science and innovation allow for a transition away from coal and other fossil fuels, coal will remain an essential uh, to the well-being and economic success of our country. Until that transition occurs, ARLP intends to be there with our low-cost operations, proudly supporting the economic vitality standard of living, and quality of life that the communities we serve desire and deserve. Secondly, we recognize and embrace the ongoing transition toward new energy and power technologies. As I mentioned during our last earnings call, we intend to participate in that transition and are focused on evaluating and pursuing opportunities to do so. As these opportunities continue to develop, we plan to utilize the talent and entrepreneurial spirit of our people, optimize the cash flow and value of our existing assets, and leverage ARLP's financial strength to pursue activities that we believe have the potential to generate attractive returns with sustainable long-term growth in cash flows. As we have always done, we intend to execute on our plans in a disciplined manner. Our capital allocation priorities will be balanced and focused designed to return cash to unit holders while providing ARLP with the flexibility to simultaneously pursue strategic opportunities, protect our balance sheet, and maintain access to capital. While challenges exist, we are optimistic and excited about the future for Alliance. As we continue to define our future, ARLP remains focused on delivering strong performance and generating attractive long-term total returns for all our stakeholders. That concludes our prepared comments, and I'll now ask the operator to open the call for questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask <coughs> a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. 
If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then 2. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question will come from Nathan Martin with Seaport Global. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking the questions. Good morning, Nate. Um, I guess first, looks like you priced an additional uh, 2 million tons in the domestic market and about 400,000 in the export market since last quarter. Can you guys give us a sense of where those incremental tons may have priced? Well, we've you know, um, all of the pricing has been embedded in our in our ranges uh, that we gave uh, in our guidance this quarter, which we did not change from the last quarter. So uh, we're right on target with what our expectations are uh, for the year. Okay, directionally, Joe, any any comments there? I mean, like you said, I saw you maintain your four year, forty to forty two dollar guidance. Well. I hesitate to discuss that. We're right in the middle of some price negotiations, so I prefer to defer that comment on a more specific basis, if you understand. Fair, Fair enough. Totally understand. Um, then maybe then on the, the roughly 5 million tons you guys have left to commit in price, kind of to get to the midpoint of your guidance, can you give us an idea, maybe the breakdown between domestic and export expectations for, for those tons? Uh, we've got about Anywhere from 500 to 800,000. Well, we've got in our plan uh, that we provided these numbers. There's right at 500,000 tons in the forecast. Uh, so that would show you the split between domestic and export that we're targeting. However, we believe that we could sell anywhere from another million to a million and a half tons in the export market, and that pricing. Uh, could be more attractive than some of the domestic opportunities, so we're trying to evaluate that as the year goes on as to whether we're better to place those tons in the export market or, or place them in the domestic market. We are pretty confident as we look at our open position and the opportunities that will be presented in 2021 uh, that we'll have plenty of opportunities to place that tonnage, uh, but we're not currently anticipating increasing volumes beyond what we've uh, given guidance to uh, in this quarter's uh, press release. Got it. Thanks for that color. And then, um, you know, you guys made some comments on this in your prepared remarks, but you did build about a million tons of inventory, I think, the 1.8 in the quarter. Brian, I believe you said, you know, maybe that's kind of rateable throughout the rest of the year. Um, can you give us maybe a more, more specific idea about kind of what you guys see for shipment cadence, you know, Q2 through Q4? Yeah, well, part of the inventory build uh, in the first quarter is obviously just due to some seasonality. Um, I mean, it's not unusual to see. Um, uh, and just to clarify too, Nate, I don't believe I said it's ratably. We just do expect that those tons will be delivered over the balance of the year. I, I believe we had, by way of example, um, 220 million tons plus or minus uh, in transit uh, scheduled for export. Um, if I recall correctly, those tons were actually uh, delivered and monetized um, uh, very early in April. Um, uh, I think in terms of overall cadence uh, going forward, uh, the normal seasonality that you see mid-year around uh, miners vacations um, and in the fourth quarter uh, due to the uh, year and holiday schedules for Thanksgiving, Christmas, et cetera, it'll be fairly typical with what we've done historically, I believe. I think that's 200,000 on the quarter, I think, instead of 200 million. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, not 200 million times. Uh, yeah, I got that too. <laughs> Thank you for correcting that. <laughs> but yeah, so we had interruptions by weather, and then we also had interruptions by transportation sources just not being able to fill out their crews. So we would hope and believe some of that will roll right into the second quarter. So, uh, but, uh, that was actually going to be one of my other questions, Joe. Uh, 
you know, you, you touched on it from transportation infrastructure kind of side of things. How is that looking today versus obviously a couple months ago during the, the polar vortex? And maybe from both both the rail and or barge standpoint. Uh, on the barge, I think we're seeing uh, with the waters you know, receding, you know, that's becoming a little bit more in focus. Uh, but on the rail side, it's continuing to be uh, an item that we're having to have discussions so that we uh, do, in fact, as we believe that the volumes will be consistent going forward, we've got to uh, be ready for you know, delivering that coal when the customer needs it and uh, when we want to deliver it. So we're having conversations. We're, we're, it's, they've been constructive. Uh, we're hopeful people will decide to go back to work. Uh, I think we've got a challenge right now uh, because throughout everywhere we see in the state of Kentucky as an example, there's 100,000 jobs that the Kentucky Chamber just posted that are open that we're finding people not wanting to come back to work. So this is a real challenge when we want to take care of people that are un unfortunately not having a job, but when we give the benefits that are so uh, you know, generous that they don't want to come back to work, it really creates a problem. And I'm not sure how that's going to shake out, but uh, you know, labor is tight. And that's across the board, whether it's service industries or railroads or coal operators or aluminum operators, labor is tight. And it's great to talk about a jobs plan, but it seems like we've got job opportunities and we need our workers to, to step up and go back to work. Got it. Well, uh, thank you guys for your, for your answers and I uh, wish you best of luck. Uh, take care. Appreciate it, Nate. Thank you. Again, if you have a question, please press star then one. Our next question will come from Alan Arsht, a private investor. Please go ahead. Good morning. Great quarter. Um, I had a question about uh, your relationship, the your royalty revenue per barrel as in relationship to West Texas intermediate crude pricing. And I mean, it's up to around $57 today. I think you were averaging in the high 30s for Q1. And I wondered, is there a one-to-one -one relationship or something less? How do you look at that? Yeah, thanks, Alan. It is uh, definitely not a one-to-one -one relationship. When we are uh, disclosing our volumes, we're doing that on a barrel of oil equivalent. Um, so that takes into uh, – account uh, natural gas. I believe that's typically converted on a six to one basis uh, for mm -hmm. uh, moving from MMBTU to barrel of oil. Um, and it also includes um, uh, our oil liquids uh, volume stream, uh, which again is not correlated to the price of oil. So when you look at our volumes uh, um, embedded within the uh, operating results and analysis table in our press release. We show that about uh, for this past quarter, a little over 48% of our BOE volumes were specifically oil. Um, and our price per uh, BOE, again, includes all three revenue streams and not just the oil stream. Got it. So when you look at yeah. our oil stream, it was reflecting the WTI oh, absolutely. for the month of March. So it does correlate. Uh, and actually, when you look at our average sales for BOE this quarter, I believe that's a record for us uh, since we've been in the oil and gas space. So with the strength in natural gas prices and, and I guess, NGLs, um, um, that should be a, a nice um, upward trend for you. Uh, yeah. I mean, the forward curve on all three of those products is uh, currently favorable. Um, expectations are um, today that they'll remain that way through the balance of this year. And just as importantly, um, you know, the volumes that we're seeing um, definitely exceeded our expectations by about 10% or so in the first quarter uh, relative to what we thought would occur. Um, so that improved pricing for those products is encouraging operator activity um, uh, in the basins that we are participating in. So we're 
in the middle of a updated reserve report for our oil and gas activities. Um, hopefully we'll be able to incorporate uh, that adjusted volume stream as well as uh, you know the forward curve and give some more details uh, during our next uh, earnings discussions. I had a, a one other question, really two. Uh, one other question about um, the possible acquisition of unrelated coal royalties. Is that in your in your plans? You know, we are looking at different ways that we could utilize uh, our talent uh, in the land royalty business. So that could be to other minerals uh, that uh, will participate at a greater level uh, with battery technology, et cetera. Uh, it could be some other land-related uh, in investments that tie to turbines, to solar facilities. To, so, yes, we're, we are looking at that segment to think in terms of deploying capital that would provide long-term stable uh, royalty uh, cash flow. I noticed uh, this is this is a kind of slightly off the subject, but some of the big dry natural gas companies have sold over, overriding royalty interests uh, as a form of financing, um, and I wondered if those could happen in the coal industry as well. Well, on the coal side, essentially, uh, it's not. I mean, when they're selling that uh, for financing, they're selling to people like us. Mm -hmm. So we could buy overriding royalties, and, and that's essentially some of what we're doing on the coal side. If you, on the mineral side, we haven't participated as much in override royalties. We could, and we've looked at that. Uh, in the coal side, we have bought properties that where we own fee, but where we've had to also buy uh, leases. And that's mm -hmm. one reason when you look at our guidance for our cost on royalties where it shows uh, in our release <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Yeah, that our royalty revenues, 245 to 255 or expenses, 95 to $1.05, that roughly a dollar are third-party leases that we have to pay to other people that own the fee property of some of the coal leases. Understood. And we own some fees ourselves, so there's a blend of some override that we're charging back to uh, our uh, lessor. So there is opportunity for uh, financing uh, coal acquisitions and or providing capacity to other coal operators. And if it would be low cost reserves, then you know, we would be interested in looking at that. That's not really where our primary interest is. Our primary interest is looking at uh, areas that would be either in the oil and gas sector or in non-fossil fuels that would participate in the transition, uh, in this new transition to a new energy uh, vision uh, that's being discussed in, in political circles today. Okay. Uh, and then finally, I was curious about the details of your recent bond offering. I I looked. I didn't see them in your release. Uh, the bonds were issued a number of years ago. They they mature oh. in May of 25. Um, uh, currently, they're trading uh, about 93 and a half. I think is the last trade I saw, um, which is roughly a 9.5 percent yield uh, compared to the face of 7.5 percent. Oh, I, I thought you had refinanced. Uh, that was... Oh, you, you may be, yeah, you may be thinking about our revolving credit facilities with our commercial banks. Uh, we redid that um, a year ago in March, and it, it matures in uh, March of 2024. Gotcha. Well, thanks again, and a great quarter. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it, Alan. Thank you. Our next question will come from Lucas Pipes with B. Riley. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everybody. Morning, Lucas. Um, uh, Joe and, and Brian, uh, you, you mentioned the royalty business in your prepared remarks, uh, specifically the value are between where Alliance is trading today and where you see your comps uh, for the royalty business trade. And 
uh, and now you're also shifting um, uh, royalty, coal royalty profits into into that segment, further uh, further in, increasing its its relative size. And so, so I wondered what, what's what's the end game to to close this arb? Uh, is it uh, separating these businesses completely? Um, a public listing, for example, uh, would really appreciate your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. And, and it, you know, right now, Lucas, we're trying to make sure people understand our cash flows. And when you think of that, our, uh, we don't see any difference between a coal royalty and an oil and gas royalty in the sense that they're both stable cash flows from production with limited capital, limited operating expense, limited working capital, and we've got management teams that basically are managing land, whether it's oil and gas or coal, it's similar. So as we think about trying to manage those together to, to bring some efficiencies, uh, we felt it was uh, reasonable to say, you know, let's bring these cash flows that are very predictable on the coal side that we know from our mine plans that, you know, we're going to be mining for the next 10 years plus, that that should be provided to this uh, segment to provide the ability that when we go try to finance oil and gas acquisitions in particular, uh, we may be able to get a lower cost of uh, financing than we would be if we try to do it as a coal company. So it's really driven more by our financing needs and thinking on ways we can finance our growth of our company. ESG has discriminated against a well-run coal company like ours. If you took the name of coal off of our company, we would be able to borrow in the low single digits. But because we're a coal company, people want to charge us double digits. Just because of an ESG stigma or whatever that they want to call it, but I mean, we're being discriminated against and we need to find uh, a way to address that issue. But in the interim, I think one way to provide uh, ability to get low cost financing is to show stable cash flow to potential lenders that would allow for uh, us growing that segment without uh, having to borrow at rates that are not justifiable. Uh, so I think that's part strategy uh, as far as trying to grow it. We do want to grow it, but we're trying to grow it primarily to grow the strength of Alliance. You know, we are in transition. We think that transition should be 15 to 20 years, not five to, or not nine to 15. Uh, mm -hmm. In the thought of the, you know, what in the world can the utility industry really do, practically speaking? I mean. Most utility executives talk in terms of 2050, not 2030 or 2035. And 2030 to 2035 is just not practical. It's, you know, we're, the administration is not telling the truth. They're misleading the American people and investors to believe that we can transition that fast. Now, having said that, we've got to deal with reality. They may do it anyway. And so we've got to think in terms of how do we take the cash flow we have today, redeploy it so that by 2030, 2035, we've got as much cash flow generated in the future as we have today and hopefully even more. Uh, so we've got to grow where the market's going to be. So I think minerals can be a large part of that. Yes, there's some effort as well on the transportation sector to reduce the demand. But everything I read believes that uh, EVs, best case, most optimistic case, may penetrate 50% of the market. And uh, I think that's a very uh, aggressive target. Uh, so we believe that investing in oil and gas still will provide for good long-term returns for, you know, three decades. Uh, and so we're not, you know, we're still feeling that that's an area where we can make investments that can be very attractive, uh, that, uh, that where we've got a, a solid base that we can uh, invest around to where we can uh, generate long-term uh, investments or uh, returns for our, uh, for our shareholders. So really, really appreciate all this color, super helpful. Um, uh, 
you, you touched on this just now, but but the, the balance sheet. And when, when I think about an EV to EBITDA in the threes, um, uh, one one could make the case that any any dollar that you allocate towards um, debt reduction um, uh, creates value for shareholders. <laughs> in my opinion, not. Uh, let's not get into it, but but anyway. So, it, uh, Brian, it, it, is there an argument to be made to be running this business with no leverage at all? Thank you. Uh, I mean, certainly you could, uh, in theory, suggest that. I, I don't think it makes rational sense. Um, you know, running a business uh, as we have traditionally um, in the one time uh, level. Uh, seems to be um, conservative um, and achievable. Um, you know, I think current enterprise value multiples, um, to your point, I believe, Lucas, do reflect uh, concerns about ability to refinance. Um, we do have uh, strong relationships with our banks. Uh, we recently participated in a um, uh, high yield conference um, a few months ago. Um, had very good discussions uh, with a variety of different investors. Um, and while there certainly are some who have, uh, for uh, virtue investing purposes, put um, a red line around uh, thermal coal, um, there remains a very um, uh, wide, deep pool of capital that uh, continues to be available to thermal coal. Uh, to Joe's point, uh, current cost is above where we think that should be. Um, but we are continuing to um, evaluate those markets, strengthen the relationships that we have, and look at opportunities uh, to pursue pools of capital that we haven't necessarily done so in the past. Um, I think driving our leverage uh, near one-to-one, -one, as we have done historically, remains an objective. Um, but to completely delever um, makes it pretty difficult to grow the company and I think we are absolutely focused on growth. Um, if we're able to achieve that, then uh, cash flows will take care of themselves and the ability to uh, return value to the unit holders and, and our creditors uh, will be clear. Let me add to that, Lucas. I mean, again, I think your question was centered around us being a coal company. And I think the message we're started with last quarter and we're trying to continue to talk through uh, but this is an evolving evaluation every fossil fuel company that's a publicly traded company that i pay attention to have transition teams trying to think through what is the definition of this transition and how can we participate in the transition from this energy uh, business model to the next one so we're in the energy business. Uh, our name is Alliance Resource Partners, not Alliance Coal particularly. And it was set up that way in the middle 90s because we wanted to be an investor in energy because we believe people love to have their lights on. And we saw that in Texas in spades. Two weeks of disruption of electric generation created a shortage worldwide of plastics. It's still a contributing factor to the shortage in chips that everybody's talking about. So people need to understand the scale of the U.S. energy uh, generation in this country and what it means to the world economy. And we've got relationships. We've been in this business from day one, going way back to the 60s, uh, predated me. Uh, we've been in this business and we're in the energy business, and we've got relationships with our customers, our utility customers, that if they want to transition to something else, there's no reason why we can't help be a supplier to them in whatever choice they make. There's going to be a lot of capital. You're reading about it with this, you know, the uh, the Biden infrastructure plan, $2 trillion. They're talking hundreds of billions of dollars that they want to channel back into the electric grid and, and the transportation sector. Uh, in specifics, there's $18 billion plus $4 billion that uh, Senator Manchin has earmarked. So there's $22 billion of federal money 
that's going to come to areas affected by their policy, i.e. coal communities specifically. And if who's going to invest $18 billion of federal money or take advantage of tax credits if it's not people that are already there? So I'm hopeful in conversations with the banks that they will start looking at how am I going to participate in this transition? Am I going to lend money to the solar industry, the wind industry, the transmission industry, the EV industry? Are they going to lend money to new technologies? And if they are, can we participate in that? And they can can they look at that in a different vein than just looking at us to to just the the solid cash flow that we're going to have from coal for the next 15 years? It's just unfortunate that we you get you know, we get labeled because we're in the coal company that people can't look beyond just that definition and can't look at the strength of our cash flow as a low cost producer to an essential fuel that's going to be needed over the next three quarter or three decades. Now, so we're targeting areas in areas where we live, where we have skilled people, where we have relationships with the state governments, with the federal governments, with utilities to say, we can be your partner. And uh, these skills are very transferable uh, to what we do, and and that's our target. We can't do it overnight, but we recognize that that we've been discriminated against in lending practices. And unfortunately, that's one reason why we're only using 30% of our cash flow uh, to pay to our unit holders. <laughs> we should be able to do more than that, but we are having to use our our free cash flow that we're generating without borrowing uh, to see how we're going to define what areas that we start investing in uh, to show that we have the capability to build businesses, you know, like we've done in the past and we've got a track record of doing, that we can build businesses that are ready to be financed for that future growth, whatever that transition in that time period is. Fortunately, I believe we've got two decades to do that. It may be 15 years. I don't know. Uh, but, but we're very focused on it. Fortunately, we've got enough cash flow that we can engage in businesses. And we're one of the few in these areas of coal communities that have the financial resources uh, that can benefit from all these tax credits and all this federal money that they want to uh, throw out to encourage uh, this transition uh, from uh, fossil fuels. So that's uh, that's our strategy, and uh, hopefully that helps you understand the context of how we're looking at the balance sheet. And it's something that's got some uncertainty to it, uh, and that's why we're being conservative. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, I'm very confident that uh, we're in a great, great place. Uh, to be able to take advantage of uh, these opportunities, probably more so than a lot of people. So I, I really appreciate all this color. Uh, very helpful, and I wish you in, in all of this uh, all the luck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Lucas. Our next question will come from Arthur Calavertinos with ANC Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hey, guys. A couple of questions, one short term uh, and a couple longer term, and a great, great uh, discussion be, uh, on the last question. I, I've been getting a lot of reports on Europe being very cold and being sort of running short on stuff. And I'm just wondering, on your, and particularly in, in April, what's going on with the uh, any color on the export market? What's uh, do you getting any extra lift there? Any, any anything you can speak to that? So for the month of April, uh, we've been uh, there's basically been dealing with uh, some uh, high transportation costs, uh, some driven by uh, oil prices, you know, diesel, some driven by just the capacity, some driven by the Suez Canal disruption. Uh, so there's several things that are happening in the, in the transportation piece of the business that we believe has started to, to uh, show some reduction that could provide opportunities. So we're we're still bullish. We're I mean we do sell some to Europe, but we're more targeted to India right now. And India's got the virus uh, resurging. Uh, 
that's created some pause, uh, but we're still in conversations uh, with our customers, and uh, we believe that uh, that there's definite uh, demand because not only does that virus affect the the demand for products, but it really affects the, their ability to mine coal uh, because you know we know what it did to us a year ago uh, when people uh, were testing positive as to how disruptive it can be to the operation. So uh, we continue to feel that the export market is constructive. Uh, again, I would remind that in large part, uh, this recent uh, resurgence was tied to the, the political issues between Australia and China. Uh, those still exist and they are also unpredictable. But in that backdrop, uh, you know, April was slowed a little bit because of the, the cost of the transportation. We think that will correct itself, and we do believe the second half of the year, as I said earlier, that we'll have the potential potentially to do more than a million to two million tons that, than uh, what we had planned for and what's in our current forecast. And if we do that, that would probably take away from domestic market sales and just strengthen uh, lower uh, inventories for our customers going into next year. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, th and then just a couple longer-term questions. I I've been getting a lot of research reports, just, you know, big picture thing, but just on the use of electrons, like the, the amount of electricity people are using and countries are using for the next 30 to 50 years I had a report like it's like going to increase by 60%. Again, this may be 2050. And what I'm seeing is now I'm seeing like companies like Amazon, Google, they use the, you know, they have the cloud, they have data storage, and all that stuff uses electricity. But unlike a steel plant, it never shuts off, right? I mean, in the old days, you'd have a steel plant making sheet metal right. for an F-150, and it shuts off, right? A lot of electricity, but then it shuts off. And then you can speak to like, you know, when I look at technology companies, they think of tech as being green, but these tech guys use a lot of electricity that never is supposed to shut off. And just any color you may have or thoughts on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, well, there is. And then, then you add to that the EVs. And, you know, when you start doing electric vehicles, that is an increase in demand. You know, they, you know the, the policymakers would suggest that a lot of their focus is going to be on um, buildings, and efficiency, and that that could offset some of that increased usage. Uh, you know, we'll get it. Mean, we'll see. I mean, I had the opportunity to live in New York for a year last year, uh, and there was discussions about they never, you know, they're going to tear down buildings because they're not efficient enough, and build these skyscrapers again more efficiently. But I don't know how that works uh, mathematically. But uh, so there's there's a lot of analysis. It would suggest that there, the efficiency could offset some of that growth. That's in the developed countries. Then you get into the, uh, you know, into the uh, emerging countries, which we include China and India in that. You know, there's going to continue to be tremendous uses of electricity, including coal-fired generation. So no matter what we do on fossil fuels in America, China and India are going to trump that plus. So it's right, a challenge right. that uh, you've got to think through as to are we really making a difference. I, I know it makes a lot of people feel good, but I'm not sure that the cost-benefit uh, is there for our country. But uh, I can speak about that, but I don't know that the Biden administration listens to my yeah, well, you know, it's funny. On the skyscrapers, I've heard, I've read and heard that you know you, you can build them, but there's basically very small windows. And so nobody yeah. wants that product, you know. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. I hear you. Yeah. And then, and then, um, on the on the other thing, um, well, well, two things. One, on electric cars, you know, is like what is like five or ten percent of the fleet? Like, rep, any any math on that, or like what five or ten percent of the fleet if they were electric? I think we've got two hundred twenty million cars. What does that do or mean or anything like that? Does that move the needle like permanently for for gas and coal for electricity or are we still in the early stages? And you know, it's a tough guess. Again, I think they are somewhat offset by the renewables as well as the efficiency at that level. 
Now, if you start going greater than that, then yes, there's going to be greater demand for electricity and you know, coal and natural gas. I don't know. I mean, natural gas has to supply it. I mean, that's part of the challenge that these states are dealing with is if I shut down a coal plant, am I really going to uh, replace it with a natural gas plant that you want to be shut down in five years or seven years? You've got to allow me to run that plant for 40 years. So that's a real challenge when we start throwing out all these numbers and, and, and deciding that well, we want to just cut down, shut down coal plants by 2030. Well, what are you going to replace it with? And again, you know, we've got reports, you know, the MISO report that was issued in February, you know, again, just reinforced that uh, renewable energy penetration increased more risk on their electric systems uh, back to the transmission, basically saying 30% re uh, renewables, you know, raise significant challenges and uh, and significant dollars in our transmission grid, and, and that we all know that that cannot be done in nine to ten years. You can't get permitting done that quickly. So we really need to be truthful with how long this transition is. And I think our country would be, be better served if we started talking about year 2050 with commitments to get there than starting to talk about 2030 to 2035 that, that makes it so confusing for investors uh, to, discern, to determine exactly how to make sure they're investing in the right technologies and doing it in a low-cost way where we can compete in an international uh, marketplace. Okay, agreed. And, and then the last one, just... Um... Hydrogen. I've been reading about hydrogen in, in Japan. They're doing an experiment at a utility with hydrogen from coal. So it just it got me thinking about you guys, and you mentioned it on the last call with new technologies. You threw that phrase in the last call on this call. Are you guys having a lot of incoming calls or guys that want to do hydrogen? And I assume you must have some great engineers that, that know the properties of coal and what it could do in, in the new energy era or, what, or what, what these guys are doing. And then you throw the money in on the administration's plan. It just seems like you guys may be a natural fit for some of, as a as a JV partner or some kind of alliance with one of these uh, newer like hydrogen technologies. Anything? Any I think on more of the hydrogen's focused on natural gas and it is coal, okay. but that doesn't mean that we can't have a role. But they they want to eliminate all coal mining, so they don't want any new technology that would utilize that. But there there are some carbon capture things that are being worked on that we're evaluating. So there, there are things that can be done, and, and that does feed into what you're saying. So there are some carbon capture that then would allow that to be tied into the, the hydrogen uh, formula. But uh, we we do have some folks looking at that. I, you know, I don't know that that's something we're going to pursue. Be candid. I mean, it's possible. I'm more focused on where our customers are where the footprints are that we know there's going to be a lot of capital flow and there are things that fit uh, some of our uh, not only geographic footprint but where we have people that have skills and talent that can provide uh, running businesses other than just coal mining. Okay, got you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next question will come from Matthew Fields with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, I wanted to talk about capital allocation a little bit. Um, I think you mentioned in your answer to Lucas's <coughs> question about no, no leverage that you're, you you kind of are, are trying to continue managing towards a one-time uh, level. You know, appreciate that you thought through the distribution to be, you know, 30% of your sort of cash flow after, uh, before growth projects. It, it, do you think that you're going to end the year at about one times, or is that kind of a longer term uh, target? It's more of a longer. It's more of a longer term uh, target. I mean, it's possible. I mean, you get there both two ways, right? Paying down debt or or uh, growing your EBITDA. And I think we made investments. The, the ability to make them that accretive this year would be very difficult. Uh, because, you know, we'll just be getting into them. Uh, and therefore, if we use that capital to grow, we're not paying down debt. Now, you know, where we are right now, we're effectively paid down our debt except for 
our equipment leases and our, our bonds. and our bonds. Uh, so we can still buy back the bonds, but I think that right now our focus is on trying to find growth. And if we find that growth, uh, it'll be hard to get to one times at the end of the year unless we find some great deal that we get one times EBITDA from our investment right off the bat. Well, you, you still got about ninety, ninety-five million between your out, outstanding between your AR facility and your revolver. Do you, do you see that being paid down uh, close to zero by the end of the year? A revolver, the revolver. Well, between the AR facility and revolver, you've got about yeah. The AR facility, no. 95. Yeah, so the AR facility probably will stay intact. Obviously, it depends on whether we can deploy the capital or not, but we're hopeful we can use that free cash flow to, to grow and therefore maintain our, our revolver on the AR facility. But the... Okay. And then um, your uh, I, I think your revolver shrinks by about uh, 80 million, maybe 78 million in, in May next month. Correct. Um, it, it, do you do you plan on kind of upsizing the AR facility or or growing, you know, establishing some other credit facility to, or, or are you okay with kind of that uh, reduction in sort of overall facility availability? Is it, is that just are we just going to kind of leave it there? Yeah, I, I don't think you would see us go out and uh, necessarily upsize the AR facility, um, the securitization until it renews um, in December of this year. Uh, we'll take a look at it at that point in time. Um, and obviously we are stepping down on capacity under the revolver, uh, but we have paid it down to a level where we still have uh, meaningful capacity that continues to be available to us. Um, so absent other transactions that could cause us to touch one or both of, of those uh, facilities, I think you can expect to see us leaving those in, intact for now. Okay, great. That's uh, that's it for me. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Our next question will come from Scott Ferguson with Pacific Value. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, so just so I'm clear on the distribution, um, so that $0.40 cent distribution is 30% uh, of uh, – Anticipated free cash flow for this year? Roughly, yes. Um, 40, 40 cents annualized. Yeah, yeah, 40 cents annualized. So 10 cents. And that, and that distribution level uh, is that being constrained by uh, your creditors? No, it's not. Not at all. It's wanting to make sure that we execute on our objectives of returning appropriate levels of cash to our unit holders, but maintaining uh, the flexibility to pursue the growth projects that we've been talking about. But mm -hmm. there is no constraint on our um, uh, facilities that we're bumping up against right now. We have plenty of room uh, um, with the $0.40 cents, uh, per, uh, per unit on an annualized basis. Um, and when you guys are priori prioritizing uh, cash flow uh, and doing your planning, uh, <coughs> are buybacks ever uh, in that discussion? And if they are, uh, where do they fall? Uh, obviously, we have uh, repurchased units in the past. Um, and so it's a tool that remains on the table. I think, in fact, we still have uh, six or seven or eight million dollars of uh, authorization to buy back units. Um, but again, our focus is on deploying our cash flow uh, to grow uh, as well as return that cash to our unit holders uh, through distribution. So it's possible, but I wouldn't say it's a high priority at this stage. Okay, thanks. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Brian Cantrell for any closing remarks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time this morning. Uh, good conversations. Uh, we appreciate um, your continued support of and interest in Alliance. 
Our next call to discuss our second quarter 2021 results is currently expected to occur in late July, and we hope that you'll join us again at that time. This concludes our call for today. Thanks for uh, your participation and uh, support. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.